Okay, well, I'm very excited to be here today. Um, as many of you may know, one of my former postdocs, uh, Bijong Chen, is here. And uh, so uh, this is now my second visit here. And I'm always amazed. You guys should count yourselves lucky to be here because you guys have amazing resources and amazing freedom to pursue science. And I'm very happy that one of my academic offspring found a home here. So uh, anyway, so let me go on. Um, so uh, um, the microscope, of course, is a very old technology. It's about 400 years old. And um, within 50 years, it was making major contributions to the study of small systems with Hooke and Van Leeuwenhoek. Hooke looking at uh, fleas in his book, Micrographia, which were the fleas that had just devastated London in the Black Plague. And being able to see these, these creatures as they really are kind of gets people away from the superstitions that are involved with that. Um, Hook, or Leeuwenhoek was able to make microscopes good enough to see down to bacteria. Um, and so he's called the father of microbiology as a result. Um, but it was 150 years before anyone could build a microscope better than his. And so microscopes did eventually get better until by 1880, they reached what was believed to be this fundamental limit called the diffraction limit that you couldn't see anything smaller than about half the wavelength of light. And so um, as a result, while microscopes got a little bit better in terms of light sources and different uh, contrast mechanisms, really the microscope that you could buy in 1980 wasn't that different from the microscope you could buy in 1880. So things really stagnated. Um, and as a result, other technologies came to the fore to lead the charge in biological understanding, particularly biochemistry in the 1930s and molecular biology in the 1950s. And these were so successful that today these are the dominant views by which most biologists understand biology, much more so than the microscopes. But this started to change in the 1980s thanks to the maturation of several technologies one of them being the transistor and its eventual use in, in cheap computing and also in the development of, of uh, solid state sensors. Um, the next was monoclonal antibodies and their conjugation to fluorescent dyes so that you could now look at specific proteins inside of cells. And the third was the laser which became cheap enough by the 80s that you could have very pure colors to excite fluorescence and see specific proteins inside of cells. So really what that did is it sort of ignited a revolution in microscopy. And since 1980s, there's been this Cambrian explosion of new microscopy technologies that have resulted from different combinations of these types of technologies. I was lucky enough to get in on the ground floor of this when I went to graduate school and started working in microscopy. And, and as you just heard, basically I worked on that for a while, abandoned it, did other things, but it was always kind of in the background. And in 2005, when I was looking while unemployed for a new research direction, um, I heard about a, different, a new way that one might be able to exploit new opportunities. So I think you can all agree that if, if this is a fluorescent molecule, in a regular optical microscope, it looks this big um, because of the limited resolution of the microscope. But I think you can agree that I can point to the center of that blob with much better precision than the diameter of the blob. The problem is that in a normal biological sample, there's so many fluorescent molecules so close together that they just make this uninterpretable mess. But in a trip that my friend Harold Hess and I made to Florida State in 2005, we learned about a new type of fluorescent protein, which instead of glowing green when you shine blue light on it, first nothing happens. But if you shine violet light on it, you activate the fluorescence, and then it will glow green if you shine blue light on it. And it became pretty obvious to us that if you turn that violet light down so low, you would only turn on a few molecules at a time, and then it would be likely that their fuzzy blobs would be uh, separated from one another, 
And then once they're separated, you can find the centers, plot the centers, turn on a new set of fuzzy blobs and another and another, and eventually you start to build up an image where you know the positions of all the molecules to the nanometer level and you have a super resolution microscope. So this really excited us, but it also terrified us because we said, why hasn't anybody done this already? It's so easy. So we look at the literature, we find, oh good, there's nobody apparently has done it yet, but we were scared and it was gonna take too long to write a grant and too long to get VC funding. So um, the good news is that, um, is that uh, when I left Bell, I told them all to go to hell, but when Harold left Bell, he was able to take all of his equipment with him. <laughs> so we were able to pull that out of the storage shed and put about 25K each of our own money into it. And then we decided to build this microscope on our own on his living room floor, which we could do because he wasn't married, so there was nobody to <laughs> object to doing it there. And within three months, we had the microscope built, and uh, we then had another problem in that we were two physicists who knew zero biology. But I was going to give a talk at NIH on another topic, and I asked to meet Jennifer Lippincott Schwartz, who invented this photoactivated fluorescent protein, and told her about our microscope, and she said, sure, bring it by. And a month later, we were looking at, in this case, a 70 nanometer thick cryosection through a multivesicular body in a cell. And that's the diffraction limited image, and that's the palm image, or for photoactivated localization microscopy. And if you can see at higher resolution or higher magnification, that's what you can do. So palm is a simple enough technique that you can basically get 20 nanometer resolution with a microscope you can build yourself in your living room. Um, and so that's its virtue, and that's why it took off so quickly. So in that same really lucky year of 2005, I also heard about Janelia um, and Howard Hughes Medical Institute and was one of the first hires there. And we started working on super resolution. Harold got hired there as well. And uh, so we were off to the races. So we did a number of applications in those years. Here we were looking at chemotaxis receptors and E. coli bacteria. We're able to show that these clustering of these receptors and their locations relative to the poles of the bacterium are completely predictable in terms of a stochastic model of self-assembly that doesn't have to evoke any kind of active transport. Um, with my very first postdoc, Hari Schroff, we looked at um, structures, the focal adhesions, which are the points of contact of the cell to the extracellular matrix, was able to show that many proteins that look co-localized at the diffraction limit actually form little nano aggregates that are segregated from one another. Um, another group in um, EMBL, Jan, Jan Ellenberg's group, did a beautiful study a few years later where they used the same particle averaging tricks that you use in cryo-electron microscopy to show that the certain subunits of proteins in the nuclear pore, which are little holes through which RNA passes in the nuclear membrane, um, that these subunits are oriented in a particular way that could only be told by super-resolution fluorescence because it was too ambiguous in the cryo-EM reconstructions. Harold eventually built sort of the ultimate palm microscope that used opposed objectives to actually interfere light from the same molecule and get an exquisite resolution, even better in Z than in XY, and with that, he was able to deduce the entire vertical structure of these focal adhesions from the extracellular matrix to the cytoskeleton. And in another study that he did with uh, Jennifer, he was able to show Escort, a protein which is involved in the budding of HIV viruses, actually invades the virus pr prior to the scission of the bud. So that's all the good news with, with Palm. But all the forms of super resolution, um, every form of super resolution has largely looked at fixed cells because these techniques generally take quite a bit of time. And um, the problem is, is that electron microscopists have known for years that chemical fixation changes the ultrastructure of the sample. And so uh, the, there are basically almost all the results in super resolution that have been reported so far have a big asterisk next to them because you're not sure if the chemical fixation is 
making something which is at some level artifactual. And that's something you got to keep in mind. Um, to try to deal with this problem for the next last couple of years, um, I hired a postdoc, David Hoffman, and then Harold is actually a old low temperature uh, physicist from way back. So um, really the only way to really make sure that you're locking in the structure of a cell is by doing rapid high pressure freeze of the cells. So we do high pressure freeze and then we built a cryogenic super resolution microscope that actually runs at liquid helium temperatures. And you can see this is a, um, a, uh, a high pressure frozen cell this is a chemically fixed one. At that level, it doesn't look so bad, but if you zoom in, you can see how much the endoplasmic reticulum has been disrupted by fixation at high resolution. Um, and so now we actually have found various fluorophores that actually work near absolute zero better than they do at room temperature for doing multicolor super resolution microscopy. And Harold, being the, the technical wizard that he is, has gone on to create an exquisitely beautiful focused ion beam scanning electron microscope technology for doing imaging of entire fly brains, but it turns out to be a great way of looking at cells quickly at eight nanometer isotropic resolution. And then we can do correlative imaging with protein specific contrast from either POM or another super resolution technique, SIM, on top of that to find out where the proteins are in relation to the rest of the global contrast. But even with these successes, because of the limitations of how slow the technique is and the limitations of fixation, even if you didn't have those limitations and even if you had perfect resolution, you still have a problem in that you're looking at still pictures. And I heard a talk by Scott Frazier in 2008 when he said, if the goal of, my, of biology is to understand the rules of the game by which molecules self-assemble to create an animate cell, then you're never going to be able to understand those rules by looking at a series of still pictures, no matter how good they are, just as you won't understand a football game by looking at a picture of the quarterback going back to throw a pass, and then the cheerleaders making a pyramid on the sideline, and you're saying, how are those events related to one another? So you have to look at things live. And I said, damn it, I have to do live imaging. And I've looked at dead stuff all my entire life, so now I'm only gonna look at living things. So it turns out you can do some degree of live imaging with POM, and it's a technique that we developed with Jennifer, Harold and I called SPT POM, or Single Particle Tracking POM, where instead of trying to look at the fixed relationship of millions of protein molecules, you look at the diffusion of thousands of protein molecules at a time on the sample as you photoactivate them. So here we can see an example where you're looking at both a very immobile protein, a gag, which actually creates the HIV code, versus a very mobile protein here, which VSVG that moves all across the membrane. So a great modern example of this technology is by my Genelia colleague, James Liu, who used SPT palm to study the Huntington protein involved in Huntington's disease. And so he can, these are the nuclei of two live cells, this one with the wild type protein, with this with the mutant that has this glutamine repeat which causes these aggregates to form inside of the nucleus as you can see here. And of course these aggregates have been seen, they're so large by many, many techniques for a long time, but he also did this co-labeling experiment of transcription factors that are necessary to create RNA and showed that these transcription factors are actually caught up in these aggregates and then they're trapped like quicksand. And so what potentially this could mean is that one unexpected consequence of these aggregates is that it can downregulate gene expression for certain uh, genes that rely on these specific transcription factors. In fact, I would say now, you know, in the 10 years or so that POM has been on the scene, or now what, about 13 years, I would say the most interesting biological results in my mind have actually come about through this SPT POM technique because of its ability to, to look at the kinetics of how molecules assemble inside of the cell. But again, it's still a very slow technique in general and has a limited amount of information content. And if you think about it as generally as you can, it's obvious that microscopes have to have trade-offs because 
if I want to have higher spatial resolution in an image, my image has to have more pixels. If it has more pixels, it means it's going to take more time to collect that information. And furthermore, it means during that longer period of time, I'm throwing more damaging light at the specimen. So there's always going to be trade-offs in terms of resolution, toxicity, speed, and how deep that you can image. And palm is really a technique that's all about getting as much in this direction as you can, even if it sacrifices its performance in terms of these other metrics. Well, the guy who understood these trade-offs much better than the rest of us, earlier than the rest of us, was Mats Gustafsson, who, while he was a postdoc at UCSF, developed a different form of super-resolution called structured illumination microscopy. In this technique, one uses a grading pattern on top of the sample to create beat frequencies against the structure in the sample, which you can see in an optical microscope, and by doing so, extend the resolution by a factor of two. So it's not as high resolution as Palm, but as you can see, by having that ability to image much faster, sub-second frame rates for 1,800 time points, there's a wealth of information in there, or in this case, where you're looking at a Jercat cell, which is a T cell analog plopped against an antigen presenting cover slip, and you're looking again at 0.1 second acquisition to see the flow of actin inside of that T cell. Um, so that's way beyond what, what POM can do in terms of dynamics, even if it isn't on resolution. But it opens a whole new space that POM is less good at. And so that's all the good news. The bad news is that Mott's died of a glioblastoma in 2011 after he had moved to Janelia. And so I sort of inherited his equipment, also inherited one of his people, Lin Shao. And so Lin came to my group, and we wanted to do more to, to extend uh, Mott's results and see what can be done. So we've done a number of applications. One of them is to look at uh, non-muscle myosin which the individual molecules come together to form these big bipolar filaments. And those bipolar filaments draw together actin filaments to create the forces inside of the cell. So from this imaging, what we saw is that whereas you can get de novo formation of a bipolar filament, as you're seeing happening here, once one is formed, that actually can form the template for others to pull off from it as they grow further. So it's far more likely that you have this sort of catalyzed formation of new, of new filaments rather than de novo formation. You get this sort of cascading effect then as, as the filaments start to form. With another group at NIH, we were able to show that there is a protein formin which is essential to create and establish this sort of uh, stereotypical um, circular formation of the immunological synapse in T cells. With Tobias Meyer's group at Stanford, we were able to show that during the collective migration of endothelial cells, it appears in a confocal microscope as if the cytoskeleton is actually piercing from one cell to the other in the epithelial tissue. But we were able to show that the leading cells leave behind trailing fingers that are coherent wrench to which the trailing cells attach and then model their actin cytoskeleton to match the cytoskeleton of the next cell. Um, and with Jennifer's group, it, once we recruited Jennifer to Janelia, we looked at the dynamics of the endoplasmic reticulum in detail. If you look in a textbook, it describes the ER as consisting of tubules and sheets. But it turns out that many of these sheets are just look like sheets at confocal resolution because you have neither the speed nor the resolution to resolve them as just clusters of little tubules, as you can see here, that kind of come together and then come apart again. So one of the things that Moss was working on when he passed away was a way to break through this 2x resolution barrier of SIM by, going to high, by using the same sort of photo switching techniques that are behind Palm. And so I hired a postdoc, Dong Lee, to work on this problem. And the solution that he came up with is to actually, rather than photoactivate the entire sample and then bleach it away or deplete it away, except in small areas, we would photoactivate with one pattern 
and then read it out with another pattern. And by using two patterns, basically we get an extra harmonic in the information, so we go up to three times beyond the diffraction limit in t instead of twice and get close to 60 nanometer resolution, as you can see. Well, the screen's a little dark in this case to see it, but trust me, it's there anyway. Um, so we used that to study then um, early endosomes and their um, confinement by the actin cytoskeleton, and also to look at um, uh, alfactinin, which is a protein involved in bundling actin filaments together, and, sh and look at them in these filopodia and these uh, ruffling edges of, of the cell membrane. Um, more recently, Dong has now moved on to his own lab at um, Institute of Biophysics in uh, Beijing, where he's developed a form of SIM. One of the problems of the SIM methods I've shown so far is we're usually doing it what's known as total internal reflection. So we're only looking at about the 100 nanometers closest to the cover slip, so a lot of the cell is not visible. And we do that because SIM is a technique, if there's too much out of focus light, the signal to noise gets too low. But Dong found a way of going just a bit deeper, what we call grazing incidence, where it illuminates about a micron thick, where you can see most of the organelles near the surface. And with that, he's able to do very fast, up to 266 frames a second, multicolor imaging of organelle interactions. So here you can see how the endoplasmic reticulum is actually modeled by the microtubules and how lysosomes are under active transport along those microtubules as well. And as they move along, they can remodel the endoplasmic reticulum by pushing them out of the way. Also show how the endoplasmic reticulum is responsible for fissioning and fusing my, uh, mitochondria. And another advantage of this grazing incidence technique is you're really not limited anymore to thin samples because you're not illuminating anything but the bottom. And so in this case, we're looking at a 200 micron thick um, Drosophila embryo and looking at a stage, um, early stage of embryogenesis before the epithelial cells come around. And so in these amniocerosis cells, we can see all the single actin filaments as they undergo these sort of positive feedback contractions of the actin cytoskeleton prior to that dorsal closure. So all of that is fine, but we're still largely in flatland in all those experiments I've been describing. And um, the, the thing is, is that the cell really is a four-dimensional system. Every living thing is a complex pocket of thermo, of, uh, a complex thermodynamic pocket of reduced entropy. And matter and energy is flowing through it continuously. And so the only way we're really going to get the true handle on how molecules come together to create the animate cell is by imaging the live cell non-destructively with high resolution across all four dimensions of space and time at the same time. And so when I got really frustrated with the limitations of Palm in 2008, and I heard that talk by Scott Frazier about the necessity of doing live imaging, I wanted to see if I could make a contribution in this field instead. And it turns out there is an opportunity there because the usual methods people use in biology to do 3D live imaging are the wide field microscope and the confocal microscope. The problems with these methods is that they illuminate the entire thickness of the sample, even, only, even though only one plane is in focus at any one time. And so, in my mind, one of the most important innovations in microscopy in this century was when Ernst Stelzer at the EMBL reintroduced a 100-year-old idea called plane illumination, where instead of bringing the light from above, you use a cylindrical lens to create a sheet which is coincident with the focal plane. And so there's no illumination above and below, so there's no bleaching, no toxicity in those regions. Because the whole plane is illuminated at once, you can take a very fast image with a camera on that and then sweep that axially through the sample and get a 3D image and then repeat it to look at the dynamics in 3D. So this has been transformative for studying embryogenesis at single cell resolution. Um, but it has a limitation, and that's that there's a trade-off between how long a light sheet can remain flat for a given thickness. And if you want to cover something much bigger than a cell, the light sheet typically has to be several microns thick. 
but a cultured cell might be several microns thick, so you're not gaining a lot. So the trick we came up with initially was instead of using what's called Gaussian illumination, we would use something called a Bessel beam, which is the same technology you have in a scanner in a supermarket for checkout, which creates a very long, thin spear of light, which can then scan across the barcode even if it's far away. Well, in this way, you can make a much longer, thinner light sheet than the conventional means. Turned out that that worked, and it turned out as we developed the technology, and the guy who developed this technology is sitting right there, it's Bijan, and what we found is that we can create massively parallel arrays of these Bessel beams at very well-defined spacings that create optimal light sheets of super thinness but spreads the energy out across the plane. And we found that by spreading that energy versus the point scanning of confocal microscopes, that not only is this microscope a lot faster, not only is it axial resolution much better, it also is much, much more gentle to cells and so that you can look at them for long periods of time. And so um, this, is, this was Bijong's work from that era. Um, so this is the lattice light sheet microscope. I don't know how many groups you worked with, at least probably 20 in your time there. At this point, we've worked with probably 70 different groups with lattice light sheet in my own lab. Um, we have an imaging center at Genelia, which has worked with another 75 different groups. Um, we've uh, built a second generation version of that instrument, um, which we offer to people if they want to build their own. We give them all the plans and, and uh, code and, and, uh, and advice on how to put it together. 90 different groups have signed research licenses to this point. Um, so. Um, this microscope has been, frankly, a winner. I mean, I'm very proud of what we've done with Palm. I think Palm is a very useful tool, but it's also my belief that Lattice Light Sheet will be the most important innovation I make in my lifetime. Um, and so an example is like, here you're looking at a slime mold amoeboid that's moving around. You see this lightning bolt. So we render this movie, and we ask the collaborator, um, or the collaborator asks us, so what was that, that lightning bolt there? And they say, we don't know. You tell us. You're the biologist, you know. I have never felt more like Galileo than I have with this microscope because everywhere we point it and every new collaborator comes by sees their cells in a way they've never seen them before. They all go away with big smiles on their faces and 10 terabytes of data. And then a month later, they call us up crying because they have no idea what to do with 10 terabytes of data. <laughs> And that's really the Achilles heel of these modern microscopes right now, is they produce such prodigious volumes of data. There is richness of understanding locked away on these hard drives, and nobody yet has the tools to extract the real quantitative information that exists in these data sets. And that's a problem that, that is the most pressing problem of microscopy today, in my opinion, that remains to be resolved. So I'll skip this one, but it turns out to be a great tool for doing single molecule imaging in, in multicellular systems. This has become a very big deal for transcription. Um, one of the real surprises came from, again, looking at single transcription factor molecules by um, SPT palm in the nucleus or in multicellular systems where the background was too, uh, too unforgiving to see without the lattice. And what they found is that the, normally there's this whole um, literature about how transcription happens with a, uh, a whole complex of proteins that move along the DNA and spit out RNA. Well, what was found by these techniques is that that picture is totally wrong. And instead, single transcription factor molecules bind for only a few seconds and pop off. And then basically they start to form clusters or hubs together where different copies go on to the DNA at different times. What I'm trying to get at between like Dong's work that I just showed you with those organelle organelle interactions and the kinds of things you're seeing at the single molecule level is the picture that you learn in most cell biology textbooks or courses about how the cell works is a caricature. It's an incredibly primitive thing 
because it comes through a static view of the cell. The cell is an incredibly dynamic place. And the smaller the length scale you go, the more dynamic it gets. And so we have to basically relearn how the cell really works. And these are the tools to allow us to do that. So um, some of the applications of lattice light sheet. Um, we worked with a group at um, Riken in Japan to look at um, how microtubules are formed during mitosis. Um, it was believed in most models that all of them form at the centrosomes. But based on the tracks that these microtubules were making, they were able to determine that there is de novo formation of new microtubules at the metaphase plate prior to division. We worked with Tommy Kierkhausen's group at Harvard to look at migrating uh, cells. And we're able to show that clathrin-mediated endocytosis is shut down on the top surface of the cell where there's, this, where there's this new membrane creating these ruffles. And Tommy believes that if, endos if exocytosis is happening normally, by shutting down exocytosis, you create an imbalance, which creates a net deposition of membrane at that leading edge to create those ruffles. And then behind that, endocytosis goes into overdrive to then suck back in those ruffles later on. Um, we work with Jillian Griffith's group at um, Cambridge to look at primary T cells working up against antigen presenting cells and was able to study the flow of actin not just in the immun immunological synapse as you do in a 2D prep, but actually watch the flow of actin along the sides of the T cell in 3D. Um, with Gokul uh, Upada Hayalu and Tommy's group, he calibrated his lattice light sheet microscope for single molecule sensitivity and was able to show that even though for at least Shiga toxin is a cargo, more events happen for bringing cargos into the cell without clathrin, by clathrin independent endocytosis. Because the cargos are so much bigger because of the, of the help of the clathrin, the total amount is still higher through clathrin, clathrin mediated endocytosis. Um, we built a microscope for uh, Max Crummel's group at UCSF and he used that to look at the microvilli that are on the T cells just as they approach the antigen presenting cell and was able to show that within just two minutes, those microvilli search out almost 100% of the surface area of the antigen presenting cell to actually find what are the uh, MHC complexes on that cell. And lastly, again, with Jennifer's group, she came up with a strategy to label six organelles at once so that we could, in 3D, be able to look at the interactions between organelles. Sort of like Dong's experiment, not as at high resolution, but being able to do it in 3D to see exactly the points of contact. Found out that e mito ER contacts are ubiquitous in 3D in the cell. And furthermore, these are organizing points for which other organelles come and then kiss and run and presumably are doing some kind of biochemistry at those contact points. She calls that the organelle interactome. So all of that is great, but um, I've soaked, even though I'm not a biologist, I've soaked up enough biology over the years to know <coughs> what we see in the microscope are only phenotypes. And the phenotypes are the result of gene expression. And yet gene expression is controlled in part by the local environment. So if you're looking at a cultured cell on a cover slip, you are looking at a highly artificial system. So how you, can you, even no, ma no matter how good your microscope is, how you can you trust that the phenotype you observe is really the way it is in nature? We have to take cell biology away from the cover slip. And we have to see cells in their native environment, where they evolve inside of multicellular organisms. The problem is, is that biological material, in order to function, has to be heterogeneous and furthermore, it is optically heterogeneous. And so light that goes in gets scrambled and light that comes out gets scrambled. So you can see here when we're looking at dorsal closure that as we go deeper, we lose resolution. Here we're looking at uh, neural crest stem cells that are uh, differentiating and then migrating into the olfactory epithelium in the very tip of a zebrafish embryo. And while we can watch that migration, it's nowhere near the resolution and quality that we had in those pictures I showed you of migrating cells a few slides ago. And so we have to get around this challenge. 
because again, the light sheet gets scrambled going in, the light from the light sheet gets scrambled going out, just like water on your windshield scrambles light. So how are we going to do that? Well, I give a talk about once every year about the historical connections between astronomy and microscopy. And the take home message of that talk is that microscopists are the retarded stepchildren of astronomers because we steal everything from them 50 years after they come up with it first. And so what I'm about to tell you is a couple examples of that. So you have to get rid of these aberrations. There are two ways of doing it. One is to, is to literally get rid of the aberrations by getting rid of the aberrating material. So the way astronomers were able to do this is when I was a boy, this was the best picture people had of the, of the Crab Nebula. But then finally in 1990, we put a good telescope in space. And by being above the atmosphere, which is what aberrates all the images, you were able to get aberration-free images which look like that for uh, the Crab Nebula. This telescope actually has less theoretical resolving power than this by a factor of two because its mirror is smaller. But nevertheless, its practical resolution is an order of magnitude better because it doesn't suffer from atmospheric um, aberrations. So is there a way of getting rid of aberrations in multicellular tissue? There is, and it's a big field now, which is called clearing where you put in different chemicals into the tissue to homogenize the refractive index, hopefully while not disturbing the structure that you want to see, and then look at it in the microscope. One of the most intriguing clearing protocols which has appeared on the scene is something called expansion microscopy. So in this case, you infuse your sample with a polyacrylate gel. You then do some chemistry to attach your fluorophores to the gel that you then bring in a protease and digest away all the biological stuff. So nothing that, all that's left is a phantom. Then that polyacrylate gel is put in distilled water and it expands like a baby diaper. As you can see for this fly brain here, expanding fourfold. And then if you image that with a regular microscope, it's like working with the super resolution microscope with a resolution given by the original resolution divided by the expansion factor. Well, uh, Ed's group published a paper on this in Science in 2015, and I thought it was complete nonsense. I didn't believe a word of it. But then in early 2016, uh, Ray Gao, who was sitting there as part of the workshop, and Sho Asano contacted me and said they wanted to try to do some lattice, uh, some EXM imaging with the lattice light sheet. And I said, yeah, sure, come on down. I'd love to do it. And I was just really looking forward to taking their faces and rubbing it in all the <laughs> artifactual, garbagey looking stuff that was going to come out of the lattice scope. But when we put it in, this is what we saw. You know, we basically see every axon, every spine neck, every spine, everything is there just where it's supposed to be. You could have knocked me down with a feather. I mean, I, was, I couldn't believe, A, how wrong, I, well, I, I'm wrong all the time. but. Uh, but, but this one I was really wrong on. And, and uh, I couldn't believe that things could be so, so faithfully reproduced despite all the torture of the sample preparation that goes into that. So anyway, so I started to become a believer. And so we've been working with Ed, Sho, and Ray now for, for it's unfortunately coming up on almost three years now. OK. Um, but anyway, so. The thing about expansion with lattice light sheet, the reason you want to use lattice light sheet to do expansion, not a confocal, is because a confocal will bleach the sample all to hell before you ever get to depth. And it doesn't have the resolution you want anyway. And it's too damn slow. I mean, if you expand something fourfold, that means the volume of the tissue is 64 times bigger. And if you wanted to go to 10x, it would be 1,000-fold bigger. So you need a fast, non-bleaching microscope with good resolution. And that's what the lattice is. So you can see here, this is now looking across the entire width of the mouse cortex from the white matter to the dura in three different colors at um, a subset of neurons that are expressing YFP in them. And then two colors, one to look at myelin and the other to look at, at nodes of Ranvier. And so in this volume, it becomes very easy because of the sparse labeling compared to EM to trace all the processes of neurons inside of the volume. 
at EM type, you know, coarse EM type resolution, including in this case at left, you can see all the spines that have been quantified there. So we worked with a company, Neurolucida, to do this quantification. We looked at 1,500 spines across all layers of the cortex, found out in these different layers what's, for example, the spine head diameters, backbone lengths, many other parameters we quantified. We were also able to look at where the myelination starts on the primary axon, um, called the premyelinated axon segment. We were able to characterize the uh, myelination around the axon. Um, and we were also able to show there were differences in different layers in terms of how the my when the myelination starts and whether the myelination is intermittent or continuous. Um, we also then looked at the nodes of RANVA and were able to show that for those uh, axons that extended down to the white matter, the nodes of RANVA increase in spacing with increasing dis distance from the soma. And we were able to show that the myelination around the axons is not concentric like a wire with, a, with an insulator around it, but actually very substantially as you go along the axon. Turns out that, yes, a fly brain is too damn big to fit in a lattice light sheet microscope expanded or not, but a 4X expanded fly brain fits quite nicely in the microscope. And so we've used uh, the expansion then to look entire fly brains and study, in this case, we're looking at all the dopaminergic neurons. There's about 110 of them across the fly, uh, computationally colored by different neuropill regions here. And then all the synapses across the whole fly brain. So this is then looking at the different regions with the resolution we have. We're able to characterize the density of synapses across the whole brain and the mean distances between synapses in the brain. Now, this has been done for something called the alpha-3 lobe of the mushroom body by EM, which is what we used as the gold standard to compare against, and we were actually quite close in our number. But that took years of effort by many people to get 1 80th of one brain. And for us, in just a few days, we could tell you that there are 40 million uh, synapses across the whole brain, and half a million of them synapse onto the dopaminergic neurons. We're also able to find out exactly the densities and how they vary in different neuropill regions, dependent largely on how important those regions are for memory consolidation inside of the brain. We're able to trace neurons and identify a, a diff new cell type in projection neurons into the central complex. And also, then we've studied actually uh, multiple brains to see how much the circuits repeat, what's the stereotypy of different circuits inside of the animal across different animals and we're able to show substantial differences in the number of boutons in different regions for these projection neurons in this case. Um, so that's all the EXM story, but you know, it's nice to have a technology like that. How far we'll be able to take it beyond this, I don't know, because it works great for brains, but there's many other systems at which it fails and doesn't expand properly. Um, but you know, it's always dangerous when a Nobel laureate says that something is impossible and I usually don't want to stick my neck out like that, but I'm willing to stick my neck out and say that nobody's going to be doing expansion on live samples anytime soon. <laughs> so, uh, so remember, I'm the guy who swore in 2008 I was done looking at dead things. Well, well, rape took me on a detour to look back at dead things again, but, uh, but we need to still be able to look at living cells in multicellular systems. And to do that, we have to steal the other idea from astronomers, which is adaptive optics. So to deal with, with if you have a large ground-based telescope to get rid of the effects of the atmosphere, they shine a laser into the stratosphere to create a bright artificial star, which then comes back through the aberrating atmosphere along with the dim light from the magnitude 13 galaxy or whatever they want to see. <clears throat> they both come into the telescope. You pick off the light from the guide star, put it in a sensor which measures exactly how it's been distorted by the atmosphere, and then you change the shape of a mirror to exactly cancel or balance out the aberrations from the atmosphere so that when the light from the galaxy bounces off that, it's perfectly corrected and you get an image. So this is looking at Neptune with and without adaptive optics. So that's great, but can we apply it to, uh, to microscopy? 
So that was the task of my other former postdoc, who's sitting in the audience here, Kai Wang, who's now at the Institute of Neuroscience in Shanghai. And um, so we basically do very similar principle. We use a two-photon microscope to create a steerable guide star that excites fluorescence anywhere inside of the specimen. We collect that light, um, and we put it in a Shack Hartman, and we have a deformal mirror, and we close the loop. Uh, the contrast is really bad in, on this screen here, but basically the resolution and the signal is very low because of the fuzzy spot you have in the two-photon microscope without the adaptive optics. But you turn it on, this is in the hindbrain, the neurons, the membranes of the neurons in the hindbrain once you turn on the adaptive optics. So it can be huge. So here's a couple examples. Here's using a confocal microscope with a two-photon guide star. That pink fuzz is mitochondria inside the soma of a neuron. Now we turn on the adaptive optics and you can see it. And because now we have a diffraction limited spot, we can do a valid deconvolution. And now you see the mitochondria as well as if that were a, a cell on a cover slip instead of being buried 150 microns deep. Here we're using a two photon microscope to image neurons in the zebrafish about 200 microns deep. There we're turning off the adaptive optics. That's what you would see with a state-of-the-art two-photon microscope. That's what you see with a two-photon microscope with adaptive optics. So anybody in this audience who does imaging with confocal or two-photon and multicellular systems who thinks they're getting resolution close to the diffraction limit as they go more than 50 microns deep in the specimen, I'm here to disabuse you of that notion. And really that adaptive optics would be a technology from which you would benefit greatly. So that's fine, but those were two examples in point scanning microscopes. And the other thing that I've already sworn against is I was never going to do point scanning microscopy because it's too damaging compared to lattice light sheet. So we needed to build a microscope that has adaptive optics for the light sheet that comes in, adaptive optics for the light that comes out, and then the light sheet microscope itself. So it's sort of three microscopes in one. So that was the job of Sung Lee Liu in my group, who's uh, now taken a job in the States, but he's originally from Taiwan here. Um, and uh, um, uh, here's an example from, from his work. In the very beginning, we're looking at an organoid, an intestinal organoid derived from human stem cells. You can see almost none of these little puncta in the original image. When you do just change the autofocus, still nothing. When you do the AO correction, you start to see the puncta, and once you've done the, uh, the deconvolution, you recover all the information that you had originally in a diffraction-limited system. So now things that were invisible become visible, and you can then track these clathrin-coated pits in these guys just as well as if it were a single cell on a cover slip. So we can apply this, too, to study the dynamics of organelles again. So here's an example where we're looking in the early brain of a developing zebrafish. Um, at three different organelles, the ER, Mitos, and Golgi. These are the ortho slices which show exactly how good the imaging is with the AO correction and then showing the volume being built up there. But because that correction is so good, we can then computationally separate these cells and then we can zoom on on any one cell inside of the brain there and then follow its dynamics, in this case for 200 time points, show here's a, here's a dividing cell here and how the ER changes from into sheets during that process. We see sort of staged divisions of cells over time. We can track how organelles are divided between um, uh, dividing cells into the two different daughter cells over time. Um, it's a really great tool for studying cell migration in vivo. So here we're watching the wiring up of a spinal cord so this is using a multicolor um, expressing probe that only turns on the newly formed um, neurons. And so what you're seeing is, is in this case, you're seeing the uh, axons and their growth cones as they're moving from head to tail in the fish there. And in fact, what we found is there's two classes of growth cones. So the um, axons that are forming from the ventral to the dorsal surface uh, end up splaying out their growth cones as they go, whereas the ones that are moving from head to tail keep a very tight growth cone. But in either case, as soon as they leave the soma and start to develop,
they move quickly out to the very outer edge of the developing neuropil in the spinal cord. And then once they get there, then they turn 90 degrees if they're going from top to bottom, and then move head to tail after that. So in other words, the, the spinal cord is built from the inside out, and the axons start to form layer by layer as you're going along. So here's an example, again looking at motility, now of a neutrophil inside the cavity of the inner ear of a zebrafish. And so the blue particles are dextrin that was sort of bait for the, uh, for the neutrophil to soak up since they're sort of the garbage cleaners in the cell. And what you can see is how incredibly dynamic, how incredibly modal, how incredible it is in their ability to change their shape to fit in the interstices between other cells. So this is the 3D view of that. This is the hindbrain, the skin, um, blood vessel here, a fibroblast cell that's about to divide. So there's a ton of things going on. You have 37 trillion cells in your body that are all doing this at all times, okay? That's really what life is about. And I'm so happy to have this tool because to me this is kind of the culmination of where we've been trying to go in that even with the lattice light sheet, to me it's like lo watching lions in a zoo. But this is finally looking at lions on the savanna chasing an antelope, which is the way it's supposed to be. And so this is the tool that's going to reveal biology as it is. Um, here's another case where we're looking at um, a model of cancer, a xenograft model where we inject human breast cancer cells with a group from Stony Brook into a zebrafish with uh, labeled vasculature. And they were interested to see if these uh, um, uh, cancer cells follow the same uh, three-step process that neutrophils use in order to get out of the blood vessels, where they first roll and then stick and then migrate and then eventually break through and extravasate. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. They use these long, sticky microvilli to attach to the blood vessel, slow down, gain a purchase, break through, and then they have incredible um, uh, ability to snake out their way in the interstitials between the outside cells. So all of that's great, and we published that paper in April and was very proud of it, but there was still a problem in that this microscope is a train wreck. This is a 10-foot optical table, uh, which Sung Lee put together this microscope on, and nobody would ever want to replicate that because it would just be a nightmare. And so, uh, so we've been designing a next generation lattice AO to repeat the success we had with the original lattice so that other groups can, can replicate the technology. And as we started to do that, we realized, you know, a lattice AO requires a two, a two photon source for the guide star, requires a spatial light modulator to create the lattice, requires a deformal mirror, requires galvos. You know what? We have all the components for every form of microscopy, so why not? I often say, remember that tetrahedron? I said, no microscope can do it all. But there's nothing that says that you can't put all microscopes in one box. And so that's what this is. So this is a four foot by four foot microscope that we hope to have for a component price of about 450,000 that will do all the modes you see here. It will be a confocal microscope, a two photon microscope, a multifocal confocal, a multifocal uh, super resolution microscope by image rescan. It'll be a 3D phase microscope an expansion microscope. It can do photostimulation, um, and it has an upright station uh, for mice. It has an inverted station for cells. It has a, a lattice station for embryos. Um, and all in one box, and you would press a button, and boom, it's one mode or the other. So, and I've worked really hard putting on my old, from my dad's company when I was doing product development, squeezing every bit of money I could out of the suppliers and trying to get the components as cheap as possible in order, to, in order to do this. And we're building the first seven of these right now, um, two of them for Genelia. Hopefully by December they'll be running and hopefully early next year we're gonna offer them, again, the uh, plans and everything to anybody who wants to replicate it. So. Um, the biggest problem that I have faced in my group is not about building microscopes, but in getting people to use microscopes. Does this sound familiar, Bijan? Okay, all right. So, uh, 
So we built a, an advanced imaging center at Genelia where people can come to use these pre-commercial microscopes. The, the SIM that came out of uh, Matz's group was there. Um, Harold's iPalm, the lattice light sheet. Um, this new microscope I just described will go there. And so uh, people who want to go there in order to do experiments can. But you should go to him first, OK, So uh, with his microscopes. And, um, and this has been a roaring success. And we've had, again, at least 70 people on the lattice one um, and many more on the others. Um, but um, the problem is, is that even there, it's that same problem of we've had, between all those microscopes, probably 120 users. And there's been, in four years, 16 papers published so far, which is a pretty paltry record, in my opinion despite the fact that everybody goes away with great data. And the problem is, is nobody knows how to analyze that data. And when you think about it, you know, if you're a real biologist, I'm glad I'm not a biologist because you guys have so much work to do. I mean, you know, not only do you have to do the imaging, you have 10,000 proteins to worry about. Nobody's going to let you publish the paper unless you've done all the knockouts and RNAi and drug perturbations and all the rest. And, then they'll ask you, well, why this cell type and not that cell type? Why not in this development stage or that development stage? You know, how do you know that your microscope didn't completely perturb the system? Da, 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 da. And even after you do all of that, my opinion is, is that if you replicate the experiment perfectly from time to time, you're going to get plenty of different results because biology is variable by its very, in fact, I believe the variability of biology is essential to its success in operation. And so you have to have high end of experiments on top of it to get statistical significance. And so you're talking about this vast multidimensional space of data you want to take. We have the instruments now to do that. We don't have the data analysis tools to deal with it. And so coming to Berkeley, um, my goal there is to develop another advanced imaging center there <coughs> that will have these multifunction microscopes I just described in it. But the goal isn't so much you know, the microscopes. The goal is, first and foremost, to make people happy and being able to get the information they want to publish the papers they want. But the real goal, too, is to develop out of that work image analysis tools that we can have open source so that other people who are doing lattice elsewhere or other techniques can take advantage of those open source tools. So it's really about trying to tackle the data analysis problem um, in sort of this iterative loop from the beginning, where at the consultation stage, the data scientist is just involved as the biologist and the, and the imaging specialist. And so that's really what we're working on. And so there's a model for this, which is at Berkeley, the advanced light source. I mean, that's exactly how they do these things, is the data scientist is involved during the proposal stage right at the beginning with this stuff. And then they have tons of data they have to analyze. And so those guys are just up the hill from me. And so uh, we're learning a lot from them about how to try to tackle this problem. So, so to get back to where I was in the beginning of this talk, like I said, for, you know, for optics was king for understanding biology at the submillimeter scale for, <coughs> for <coughs> at least 300 years. But for almost 100 years, it basically stalled. And biochemistry and molecular biology took over. Um, in my opinion now, with the new tools <coughs> that have been developed over the last 20 years, we now have the ability to understand the findings of molecular biology and biochemistry in the context of the spatial, spatially compartmentalized and highly dynamic cell. So we can actually really finally understand what's going on. <coughs> so with that. Um, I'd like to end by thanking, I could thank for, for an hour all of the collaborators we had, but really in this talk, it's the Lattice EM group, which is you know Ray and Sho and Ed, and the Lattice AO group, which is Gokul and, and others. <coughs> but most of all, my postdocs. As I was saying earlier today, um, what you've seen in this talk is just the tip of an iceberg, which is vast. The, EXM paper alone is a petabyte of data. The Lattice AO paper is 300 terabytes of data. Otherwise, we have probably another close to petabyte of data among all the different collaborators. And you've seen only a tiny fraction of that. 
All of that has been done by my group that has consisted on average of about three people at any one time. And I believe that my group of three outperforms any group of 50 anywhere else in the world. And it's, and it's because we are so small. And it's because we work so hard. And we work as a team. And I'm very, very thankful to three of them that are four of them with Lynn sitting in the audience here today. Thank you very much.